morning. Welcome to Oakland Church. Hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. People from many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. The Lord will mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation nor train for war anymore. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Maybe that was a good call to worship and an invitation to come to the mountain. We just believe that, uh, that we are invited to draw near to God and he promises to draw near to us. I'm excited about what he has in store for us today. I'm so glad you joined us. I'm Dave. I serve Oakland Church's lead pastor, and I greet you in Christ's name. Welcome our live stream audience and encourage all who are guests to let us know you're there. Um, encourage you to go to our website and uh, fill out a connect form. We have a little gift we'd like to send to you. Would you stand as we uh, confess together our, our corporate faith? Christ has died. Christ is coming again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day that we set aside to uh, focus on you, God. It, it is the day that uh, commemorates Christ's resurrection that happened on a, on a Sunday. So may that reality encourage our hearts that Jesus is alive and uh, he is with us. And I pray, God, that, that his spirit will be powerfully present in this sanctuary and, and in every home. May our burdens be lifted as we look to you, as we worship you, God. Um, just commit this day to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing as we worship the Lord. As we lift up a shout of joy to the Lord this morning. Hallelujah, Father. Let praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be the weapon that conquers all anxiety. Sing with all we are, we claim your victory. So let it rise, let praise arise. Yeah, we we'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Our fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of the breakthroughs on our side. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise. 
praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds. Come on, we're gonna praise you, we praise you. Cause this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. Amen. Amen. We praise you this morning.
Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Amen. God is good. God is good. <clears throat> Amen. Yes, we're so grateful, Father, this morning for the price you paid in order for us to be able to sing about victory in you, Lord. We just pray that you would inhabit our praises this morning, Jesus, that you would invade this space with your grace so glorious. Worship. 
worship and sing, and rise to reign eternally in the grace so in glory this morning Jesus and we have come into this place to honor you and, and glorify you and proclaim how majestic is your name in all the earth from the beginning of time to the end of the age you are the alpha the omega the beginning and the end the one who has created us and yet even before we were created you knew us in our innermost being the promises from your word remain as true today as the day they were written Lord your heart is for us. And so, Lord, we just uh, praise you this morning. And we just, um, we just pray that in our listening and waiting uh, this morning, that you would be honored and glorified and, and uplifted um, as we tune into what you have to say to us today. And uh, this month, as we evaluate what getting down to the nature of worship really is, um, we just pray uh, that your spirit would move among us today as your name is lifted high. We pray all these things in the precious name of the one who was sent to save us, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We, we used to say amen and stuff like that, but if you feel like clapping or whatever, that's, that's allowed. I'm, uh, I'm so happy this morning that I didn't have to put on overalls today, <laughs> although I do kind of miss the hat. And, you know, I get to wear sweater vests, just the best. It's like a warm hug from my mother. Now, I'm happy today because uh, it's worship month. I look forward to this time of year. Uh, I think we need this month kind of a reset, particularly this year, um, and I, I'm excited what God's going to do in us and then through us as, as we get worship, as we press in, um, as I said in the email I sent out, good things happen to us, you know, when we get our eyes on Jesus. Felt led to kind of tackle this, um, this question, this idea of, of true worship. What's, what's worship supposed to look like from God's perspective? But I don't want you to get anxious, like, oh man, I hope I'm not doing it wrong. Although, maybe that's a good question, a good thing to evaluate. Paul says in Philippians that we are supposed to think about that which is true and excellent and lovely and admirable and praiseworthy. So, you know, I, I, I have to believe we want to improve. We want to get it right. Also decided that it'd uh, be a good time during worship month to get to know our worship director a little better. So I've invited Jason to come out. Um, we've been on this journey together 
almost as long as I've, I've been here at Oakland, 16 years. You, you thought you didn't start till 2005, but it was like three months after I got here. I <laughs> tapped you on your shoulder and yeah. said, the Lord has need of you. So, yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little, little bit about your journey, you know, what brought you to leading worship here at Oakland and some insights that you may have gleaned along the way. Sure, sure. Well, first, some of you, I uh, have to acknowledge your presence that uh, some of you may not know me, so just a quick introduction. My name is Jason McHenry, and my journey um, really started back at, at childhood in my relationship with kind of music, uh, and it's always kind of been something that God, I think, has laced into my heart, and I was singing at a young age, and it was just kind of all um, a part of, of what I did. Music was very important to me. And of course, um, the other kind of component of that is being comfortable on stage and in front of people it was, again, kind of just the way God uh, knitted me and equipped me to, to eventually serve him uh, to the path here. So those are probably the two big things from childhood. But then as I transitioned uh, after graduating uh, from Olivet, so I'm bringing probably the other piece of of knowledge that might be helpful to know is I grew up in a Nazarene church, uh, so my story is usually one that is expo I was exposed to the gospel and to Christ at a, at a really young age. I grew up in a church in Illinois, and then uh, a family from that church moved up here, um, and then that was kind of my connection to Cedar Rapids. And so then as we uh, started, as I started to attend here, um, yeah, so 0405 was kind of the, the neighborhood of time that, that you had joined the staff here. And before that, we were doing mostly choral work. Some music was mostly choir and maybe a little bit of a special music, uh, you know, was, was kind of a thing that we were doing then. So people would sing individual songs. And then um, around about that time, what was happening in churches, not just here, but, but everywhere, is kind of the transition into praise band and uh, the idea of being seeker sensitive, which was, you know, a lot of times the... The languages that we use in the praise songs and, and some of the antiquated songs or the older songs, uh, that language may be not understood as well to people outside of the, the church. So I think there was kind of movement within contemporary Christianity to speak a language that, that those that weren't as entwined in that uh, would understand. And part of that was introducing drums and uh, other instruments uh, as well as kind of going away from choral music seemed to be the... The transition at that time. So um, I, in those early days when I kind of first started, I was very rough around the edges from a musical standpoint. I didn't know a whole lot about how songs were crafted together or how to communicate with a band. I remember those early practices sometimes would take like three hours, four hours. People would be leaving the practice and just be like, Ugh, I don't feel any better. In fact, I feel worse than when I came. So the, definitely early on, if you were a part of that, there's maybe a few of you that are here in those days, you could probably attest to. It was fairly rough uh, musically, but I think God was in it and we were sowing the seeds of what would eventually kind of become today. And so as we improved, as I built my skills and knowledge and abilities to lead others, I think we started to attract um, talent to the group uh, to the point that you kind of see it today, which we're very blessed to have talented musicians that, that have a heart for God and, and worship. And so um, that's kind of my journey. I mean, there's obviously many other beats along the way, but that's kind of where it started. Key pieces were, I think what I mentioned to the earlier group was understanding um, that it's not my team, but it's it's God's worship team. I mean, that that He's going to bring people in and provide people that need to be here for this period of time. So there was definitely early on seasons of when people would leave, I'd kind of, you know, pull what little hair I had at the time out and be like, what am I going to do? And if you've been in a ministry, leading a ministry, I know that maybe you've, you've had that. But I gave the ministry to God at fairly early on in the process and said, Lord, bring in who you want to bring in. Help me to, you know, build them up, help them grow and use us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, what other personal experiences or philosophies uh, inform you as a worship leader? Yeah. yeah, there's probably two that came to mind uh, when thinking about my own personal philosophies, which is one is building an attitude of gratitude as you, as I thought, you know, over the last few years and, and beyond that, 
uh, who do you want to be as a person? You know, who, who, what things do you want to leave behind and what things do you want to pick up and, and ultimately become the way you approach problems and challenges and successes in your life? And part of that is I want to cultivate an attitude of gratitude, which is understanding that I, I can never learn enough to know it all. I can never have it enough in my life or accumulate enough things that I still don't need a savior. Um, and that, I think the third one was, oh, have enough experiences that growth isn't necessary. You can never go through much, you know, go through things enough to the point where, oh, I don't need to grow anymore. So I think those things, I've kind of adopted into that philosophy. And so that's always kind of constantly asking yourself, hey, if I don't have it all together, I need you, Lord, to help inform me, right? And, and in that posture, the Lord is constantly showing me things that I need to improve on. And so most recently, that's been preparing my heart as much as I prepare the music. And so we have prayer meetings on uh, Saturday night at seven o'clock. And I don't know that I had really been attending those really at all for the last couple of years. But then it just so happens that I was coming in to prepare a Saturday night for a particularly tricky musical piece. So I was just going to spend some extra time in preparation on that. But they were meeting at the same time uh, in the prayer meeting, and the Lord kind of redirected me. I was coming through the upper stairs, and, and it almost was like, no, you need, I know what you've got in your plans for this evening, but I need you to be in here. And I need you to spend as much time preparing your heart uh, as you do in the music. And that, that's been a really important thing for me, for me to grab onto um, here recently. Um, and then the other one is just always be learning kind of that's kind of something I'm trying to instill in my my kids and my family is like we're going to be lifelong learners and um, always pick up something new so back in 05 out of need for just having an acoustic guitar that's when I first picked it up and kind of taught myself and I'm spending time learning the piano and what that does is it helps me communicate better with my team it helps me understand music a little bit better and so that what I can bring to the table you know you're like well how does that translate to the worship experience? Well, it builds comfort in all of us. If we know from the team, if we're comfortable with it, that's going to translate to the worship experience and removing roadblocks. That's kind of what we're about. Like as a worship leader, what can we do to remove roadblocks for people to connect with, with God? So those are the two yeah. things, uh, lifelong learning, attitude of gratitude. Yeah. And we've seen you grow. Those of us have been around a while. I, I, I think it's so important that, you know, when, when we're serving, we, we got to do our part. We got to give our best to God, but without his efforts, it's in vain. So I, I'm glad that you've latched on to that. Um, we, uh, we talk around here, I do, about being extravagant worshipers. Um, what, does that, what does that look like in your mind? How can we as a church become more extravagant, become better worshipers? Yeah, yeah, this is, it was a good question and one that was tough to kind of wrestle with a little bit uh, because it, you want to start with like, well, what does your idea of good worship look like, you know? And so it's not one that's not at the root of what worship is. It's not necessarily what I envision for us or like, well, it looks like everybody has their hands up or it looks like everybody's belting out, you know, the, along with me. I, I understand as we come into a corporate place of, of worship and we all kind of bring our own knowledge, skills, abilities, baggage, anything else that goes along with that into a Sunday morning. I understand that. And I understand that, that uh, you know, maybe music doesn't connect with everybody the same way that it does with me. But I think the, the vision that I would have is to help cultivate participation. I think that the Lord, you know, it just, you don't really read anywhere in scripture, like sit in complacency to the Lord. You know, it's always sing or exalt or, you know, raise a hand or clapping or there is those that language in the scripture and most of it is one of action, you know. So so that's what I would encourage us and, and that's kind of what I'm exploring in this particular month as we do that. How do I help inform, for one, I think, you know, how do I disciple us as a group to say, this is kind of why we're doing what we're doing. And if you understand the why and the meaning behind it, then maybe that'll remove that roadblock um, to, to participating and encouraging. And so that's, I think, the, the biggest thing that I would say. 
is participation, and it happens on a daily basis. So I talked about preparing our hearts. I would encourage you to do that as well. That's another thing that I think extravagant worship doesn't begin and end on Sunday mornings, right? right? It's, it's right. an everyday thing. And I, in my own life, that's a challenge in my own life. When I wake up, what's the first thing that I'm doing? How am I preparing my heart to encounter what I'm going to encounter for the day? Um, so that's to me, that's my encouragement to you as we approach this month and we kind of explore that together. Um, know that it's a journey. Know that we're in it together. Uh, one other point that I talked about this morning is as we gather corporately, doing those acts of worship help encourage each other. So while the communication is vertical between our spirit and the Lord's, it also helps encourage each other when I see Pastor Dave worshiping with his hands up. And yeah, he... Do you love the Lord? I love the Lord too. He's worthy. He's awesome. He's worthy of our praise. And when I see that expressed on your faces and you see that expressed on mine, we come into community around that. And we just can say, yes, that's why we have gathered together to honor the Lord. And that to me is what really extravagant worship is, setting everything else aside. I'm not going to let my concerns, my, my appearance, you know, like what I look like, how I feel, Mm -hmm. and we'll talk later on about sacrificial worship, but Mm -hmm. that's, to me, what I'm hoping we get out of this month. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for talking to us and for your leadership here. Bless you. Yeah, you can clap or cheer or boo. I don't know. Today, we're going to talk about worshiping in spirit and truth. And our desire to get it right, we got to look to the Word. I, I think the Bible has some definite counsel for us this month. So, we're going to look at John chapter 4, kind of a well-known passage that mentions that. I um, encourage you to follow along if you have a Bible. If you don't, we keep some in back. Live stream audience, if you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'll send you one. Uh, we'll send you the family Christian store, the Christian store, and and Kirk will give you a good deal. Stand with me as we look at these verses together. John chapter 4, starting with verse 13, just a brief context. Jesus is interacting with the Samaritan woman at the well. Um, It's it's an awesome story, but I want to hone in on, on one thing Jesus says. So picking up at verse 13, Jesus replied to anyone who drinks this water, The water he has to offer will, I'm sorry, actual water will become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. And I wish I knew if she's being sarcastic with this next, these next words. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here and get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. You have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshiped? Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good job. Since the time of David... The Jews had been worshiping in Jerusalem, 
That's where the temple was. That's where the altar was, where they presented their sacrifices to the Lord. What God instructed them to do. Even those Jews who didn't live in Jerusalem were required to make several trips during the year to worship and sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. But after the exile, the the half-Jews called Samaritans They decided that was too far to go, or maybe they just didn't feel welcome in Jerusalem. So they made their own altar, their own place of worship on Mount Gerizim. The woman's asking Jesus, is is that okay? It's a good question. Where can we worship? Where does it have have to take place? And what Jesus says is pretty revolutionary, you know, particularly to his audience. He says, no, you don't have to come here, you know, come to the holy city. And it doesn't even have to be, you know, at this particular site where your ancestors worshipped. He said, you can worship anywhere. And he's the one who made that possible. He said that the time has come and is here. It arrived with the person of Jesus. And and really it was when he died on the cross and shed his blood, he made a way for all of us to approach God with our worship, with our prayers. Through the blood of Jesus, he made a way. That's good news for, uh, for those, you know, who are worshiping at home through a live stream, um, that you you don't have to come to a certain place to worship God. You can encounter him in your home, you know, um, in a forest, (laughs) on a lake. Um, God can be everywhere. But I want to point out that just because he can be everywhere and worship can take place Anywhere, everything isn't worship. I mean, there's a difference between enjoying God's presence when you're taking a hike and, you know, focusing on God, meditating on Him, honoring Him, giving Him His worth. That's why we we like to gather together for this hour to really focus our attention and our hearts on his presence. And and I hope it becomes, you know, a daily rhythm to our lives that that we are worshipers every day of the week. But it is good news during this pandemic year and whatever the future holds that, that God will meet us where we're at if we come to him with humility and and in desperation. So that was uh, pretty revolutionary, but it pales in comparison to what else Jesus was saying here. If you were to ask Jesus, or I'm sorry, ask a Jewish person, well, who is invited to worship God? They'd say, well, we are. We're, we're God's chosen people. We're, we're the circumcised people. You know, we're, we're the ones God likes and wants to be near him. And Jesus is obviously saying, well, even the Samaritans can come. This group of people that used to be Jewish. They used to be part of um, the northern kingdom of Israel, the, the 10 tribes, you know, fully Jews. But when the Assyrian army invaded in 721 B.C., and conquered the northern kingdom, they began to intermarry. And, you know, that wasn't so much the problem that, that they, you know, were a mixed race. It was that they were mixed religions. They obviously, you know, cared about God, the one true God, but they also maybe, also, you know, worshipped or followed other gods. And Jesus is saying even Samaritans are invited to worship. And if that wasn't scandalous enough, this woman who has been divorced five times, well, maybe a couple of her husbands died, but 
you know, she'd been through a few, and she's living with a man who's not her husband, which, you know, the Bible makes it clear, that's not okay. Even this woman is invited to approach the throne of God. Who can worship? Anyone can. If. <laughs> Everyone's invited, but there's a condition. <laughs> They've got to come, you know, and, and this is the way we phrase it. It may sound odd, but through the blood of Christ, through faith in Jesus, through humility and repentance and embracing his leadership and lordship, we can all come. But you got to meet that condition. You know what it takes to become a, a citizen of the United States? You got to fill out an application. Uh, you got to have an interview. You got to pay a fee. I learned it's like $725. And, you know, take your oath. A lot of hard work if you want the privilege of being an American. We'll thank God that Jesus did the hard work by coming and in, in taking our place, taking the wrath of God for us. But we have to believe in him. We have to humble ourselves and acknowledge that he is our only hope. He is the only way that we have any right to be in God's presence. I think that's what it means to worship in spirit. You know, an attitude is, is good. Um, your emotions are part of worshiping. But I think, I think Jesus, you know, in light of the context, is, is saying that, that if we want to be worshipers of God, if we want to have access to the creator of the universe, we have to be born of the spirit of God. We have to be born again or saved. In the previous chapter of John's gospel, Jesus is interacting with a, a religious leader named Nicodemus, a good man who studied the scriptures and probably did way more good than bad, but he says to Nicodemus, you have to be born again, born of the Spirit of God. If, if you want to be part of the kingdom of God, if you want to be a child of God with the privilege of worship and prayer. So, preacher... That's what you say when you're mad at me. Are you saying that, that lost people can't worship? Yes. I mean, if they don't realize, you know, that they're lost and trust Christ for salvation and, and receive the miracle of new birth, then I don't think their worship means anything to God. Like Paul says of, of love, that their worship is probably like a clanging gong or a resounding symbol. Until they have embraced God as their redeemer and Jesus as their savior, their words, their deeds just don't matter that much. But I'm not saying that, you know, people who haven't come to faith shouldn't be in church, by all means they should come and be in the place where they can encounter the living God, because I believe that Isaiah 6 thing can happen, you know, in the presence of God, when you see him for who he is, and I think that happens when we worship well, then you see yourself clearly, and you see your desperate need for help, and you become a candidate for his grace. So bring your pre-Christian family members and friends and, and let's pray that, that God will reveal himself to us in a, a profound way because I think, I think people will be changed. But I, I'm trying to say, may not be saying it well, that, that worship is our language. It is the language of the redeemed. It's it should come naturally to us. It's, it's what we speak and sing and do. You ever seen a, a newborn baby, a young baby, 
when his mother, his or her mother walks in the room. I mean, they're just pitching fit. They're so excited. They're cooing and making sounds. And that's us, children of God, when we're in the presence of our creator and redeemer. How can we, how can we stay silent? Zacchaeus, when Jesus made him new, couldn't help but, but give half his possessions away. The Philippian jailer, when he encountered the life-changing message of Jesus Christ, just he had to serve the apostles. He had to bandage their wounds and bring them into his own house for a meal. Saw himself when he was changed by Jesus. I have to proclaim this good news to others. And throughout the, the New Testament, when people are made new, they can't help but praise. I don't know how well we did first time, but let's, let's, let's try again. Let's join our hearts and voices in worshiping our great God and our Savior. Let's stand together. And when I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Can we sing? Then sings my soul. My Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art.
saying that you got to be like this to worship God. And it may not be music. It's, it's the giving, the serving, the sharing, the responding that gives God his worth. But as Jason said, we can't be passive. But what if you are? What if I can't speak the language like nothing's happening. Well, maybe you had a, a really bad week, and that happens, or a bad morning. It seems like the devil likes to mess with us on Sundays for whatever. Well, he doesn't want us to encounter God. And it's been a hard year <laughs> for a lot of us. Um, But maybe it's more than that, you know. You just aren't full of awe and gratitude to God. You don't want to sing. You don't even want to come to church. What do you do with that? Well, I, I think some introspection is in order. Because those born of the Spirit worship our spiritual God, but if, if you can't, if you won't, then you probably have a spiritual problem. Something is not right. But here's the good news. God has a solution. When we repent, when we're sorry and, and willing to leave those things behind that are hindering us. He, he brings refreshment. He can restore joy to, to your souls and make you a willing worshiper. That's why you're here on planet Earth to worship God. And you can't let anything hinder that. You can't allow there to be barriers between us and God. Not just so we can have a good month, but, but it's, it's why, why he created us. And when we worship him, he works powerfully in us and through us. So search my heart, oh God. Help me to see if there's something hindering my relationship with you and my worship. Let's just give him that right now. God, set us free to love you and enjoy you and to worship you as you deserve. Lord, if we're clinging to something in this life, something in this world that we know we shouldn't, something that we've put ahead of you, God, would you... Would you take it from us? We're, we're sorry, Lord, that we let temporal things become too important to us and we allow the enemy to pull us away from the path. God, we don't want to be. We want to love you. We know you love us. So God, just wash me clean in these moments, I pray. 
pour out fresh grace and fresh mercy on those calling upon you right now, oh God. Restore the joy of our salvation to us, Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Amen. If you, if you prayed, if, if, you, if you gave something to God, if you're feeling joy, flood back in. I, I hope you'll let me know. Send me an email, pastor underscore dave dot org, so I can celebrate with you and support you. Let's briefly grapple with this. The, the worship and spirit became clear to me, but the, the worship and truth, I struggled with a bit. Then I, then I realized that, that Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So maybe um, this is just more of what we've already talked about, that, that we need to know Jesus. We need to be following Jesus in order to worship him. The Bible is truth. The living word of God. And it will help us worship well. It, it needs to be the center, you know, of what we do. I mean, it definitely, well, it, it guides our worship and, and informs it. We learn in the Old Testament scriptures that we're supposed to bring our best to the Lord. What he wants is what we all can offer him, the best we have. The New Testament reminds us that, that we're all priests in in Christ's kingdom, we all have something to offer. I'm challenged by that notion in 1 Corinthians 14 that, that when we gather, God may want to say something through you. Probably going to set up mics more often because maybe there's a word of knowledge or prophecy or encouragement that, that you're supposed to share with the body. We want to we wanna do those things. We want to honor God with our worship. I don't overreact to this. Worship can evolve. It, it's not always going to look the same. There's some people who feel like, you know, if, it, if it's not in here, black and white, we shouldn't be doing it in church. And if it is, we should be. So break out the snakes. No, I'm kidding. Don't, don't break out the snakes. That never was supposed to be a part of worship. It's just evidence that um, the Spirit of Jesus was with his early followers. The methods form will change. Sometimes we, we become more liturgical and, and get into confessions and creeds, and that has tremendous value. And sometimes worship seems more free-flowing and spontaneous, and, and that's good too. And sometimes we sing old songs that were written in taverns, but we've made them great hymns. And sometimes we sing new choruses, and, and it's okay as long as the message stays the same. It is Christ, him crucified and raised from the dead. He is the focus of our worship. He's the reason we sing. So we got to guard against making it about us, subjective, what I like, and if I don't like it, I'm not doing it because we're kind of missing the whole point. Worship isn't about me or you. It's about him. So let's work at getting that right this month and, and then every month. You got one more song in you, Jason? <laughs> song in itself is not what you have recorded.
About you, Jesus, about your heart for us and what you did, so we confess sometimes we give you less than you deserve, but it's all about you. King of endless worth, so much you deserve, more than I can express. By the way, when we start to worship better, we got to be okay with whatever God wants to do. And when he touches your heart, you may need to come kneel and fall before him. That's, that's allowed. We're, we're free to respond as he, as he leads us to. So God, we thank you for this service and your, uh, your invitation to draw near to you. It is scandalous that no matter what we've done in the past, you want us close to you, Jesus. And it's through the blood of Jesus that we have the right, the unthinkable privilege of being near the creator of the universe. So fill us with that sense of awe and gratitude, O oh God keep drawing us closer and closer to you, God. And we'll give you the praise. Amen. Good morning. It's good seeing all you guys here this morning. Uh, if you'd like to support Oakland financially, you can drop off your tithes or offerings in the boxes located here. And then we also have a text to give option and a give online option as well. 
And we only have one event to announce, and that is the evening of worship and prayer that's happening tonight from 6 to 7.30. There are only 30 spots in person that are available, and you have to register to be part of that online. And you can register uh, anytime today. And there also is a live stream to watch it as well. I'm going to pray, and then we will be dismissed. Dear God, thank you for a whole month to dedicate to worship and help each of us to find some time to spend in gratitude and being able to thank you for all the things that you have done. And also, we have some surgeries coming up that we want you to be a part of. So I pray they be with Becca McHenry, Bev Hess, Dave Brown, and Carl Norton. Help all the, the doctors who are performing to do their very best and also be with them as you know they might have some anxiousness and nerves going into the surgery. And also, God, I pray to be with the upcoming election and help us to know that we have lots of common ground together. And we also kind of form under the idea that our first thing that we serve is you above anyone else. And so I pray that your will be done in this election. Amen. You are dismissed.